Greetings and welcome to ISC 2019. I'm Bruce Oviagale, immediate past chair of the International Stroke Conference. Welcome to this brief interview session. I'm here with Drs. Hanley and Dr. Awad to talk about the MISTI trial. Welcome, Dan and Issam, and congratulations on the completion of a very important trial. Thank you, so Bruce. Before I launch into the results, uh, which you might share, I wanted to ask a little bit about the background and rationale for the trial. Sure. Um, I think uh, both Assam and I, uh, as we were young doctors beginning in um, emergency and ICU care, uh, were taken by the absence of things that we did for the spontaneous brain hemorrhage patient. Um, and it's been the work of both of our careers and a principle for friendship that uh, we've shared this interest. So it has long been the holy grail in cerebral hemorrhage to try to take the clot out so you improve the outcome. And this has never really been tested uh, in a minimally invasive way. It had been subjected to the classical open craniotomy, which uh, where uh, there had not been sh shown any benefit in, uh, in outcome and mortality or a weak benefit. And the hypothesis has been over the last 10 years is to develop a minimally disruptive minimally invasive approach to get the clot out and test the hypothesis whether it improves outcome. Excellent. And what was the trial methodology and design? Um, a randomized controlled trial. Um, we used a special technique called um, uh, adaptive randomization. And if you're on the other side of the Atlantic, adaptive minimization to get a balance in the three major three of the probably seven or eight, but three of the five known major factors that uh, uh, independently affect outcome, uh, and, and they're known at, at the start of the trial. Um, and then the final um, unique thing about the design uh, was, uh, because you can't mask surgery, right. and in, in this case, uh, uh, the emergent nature of the uh, brain hemorrhage doesn't lead itself to uh, to doing sham surgery. Uh, we have a blinded outcome instead. Uh, so we the uh, patient uh, after he or she has recovered uh, has a short video interview like this one, uh, and the clip is uh, sent to uh, physicians who weren't part of the care, weren't part of the institution, and uh, were as unbiased as they could be uh, of about treatment and didn't have knowledge of treatment. Uh, so uh, a high-level blinded uh, assessment of the modified Rankin score was the uh, outcome. And uh, we used a jury of five physicians mm -hmm. so that uh, the biases of individual patients were, were limited. Uh, individual cert, uh, the biases of individual uh, assessors were limited. So it sounds very rigorously designed. So what did you find? I know there are two main results, the main trial results and then another analysis. So what did you find in the main trial results? Right. Well, uh, we designed this trial uh, to look at the main result and then to have the secondaries be exploratory. Uh, and we thought that this was very important uh, because there hasn't been a, a real surgical trial with rigor that's ever been performed and absolutely none that have been performed with minimally invasive surgery. So the secondary outcomes, we ordered them, but uh, they were all exploratory. Uh, and that allowed us to do um, uh, an appropriate size trial that, that had an affordable budget for our National Institute of Health. Uh, the main result was whether or not function of the patient was improved. And we measured function with the Rankin scale uh, and we chose to uh, look at the uh, dichotomous proportion, mm -hmm. the uh, good outcomes versus poor outcomes. And we defined that in the way that our patients have told us. So the Rankin 0 to 3s were called good, mm -hmm. and the Rankin 4 to 6 were called less good or poor. Uh, and we looked at the proportion. Uh, we powered the trial uh, to find uh, a 10 to 13% uh, benefit, uh, and we found uh, a 4% benefit. 
So we did, did not uh, come in with a statistically significant result uh, on the uh, full population studied with what's called modified intention to treat. Uh, but we did find among that group with uh, the planned sensitivity analyses of the primary result uh, that mortality was improved. And we found that um, uh, in uh, a modified ordinal analysis that, that looks at the whole range of the Rankin scale. And when we looked at that, we also found that there was a point estimate uh, of a 20% shift to, uh, to better outcomes mm -hmm. across the whole scale with uh, uh, no uh, detrimental uh, increase in the, the lower levels of uh, the rank and score. So, Dan, interesting. So, how would you explain the divergence between the mortality outcome and the functional outcome? As you both well know, typically in stroke trials, if there are effects, it's usually on the functional, not the uh, mortality outcome. And if there are effects that cut across both, they usually converge. So, do you have any uh, speculation as to why there was a sure. difference here? Sure. I think that's a great question. The short answer is I think the differences relate to the difference between ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. Now, let's remember that hemorrhagic stroke has the highest proportion of disability uh, and the highest proportion of death of any stroke type. Um, and uh, until you get up to the uh, NIH stroke scale uh, level of high 20s or 30s, um, uh, death really doesn't occur from ischemic stroke. So um, there are multiple factors in play in uh, hemorrhagic stroke that are not in play in, uh, in ischemic stroke. So yes, we're not used to seeing a death benefit in ischemic stroke trials, uh, but death is less frequent. Where death is more frequent and where you address um, uh, all the mechanical dysfunctions that bleeding in the brain occurs, uh, it's highly plausible that, uh, that you might see a death benefit. Before I just launch into uh, um, some talking about his aspects of things, one of the questions I asked, I wondered was, how well did the um, investigators adhere to the protocol in terms of the treatment protocol itself? Right. Um, this is very important. We set a goal that um, we wanted large hematomas. Uh, we defined large as bigger than 30 milliliters. Uh, and we wanted to reduce them by at least half. 15 milliliters, okay? Now the average hematoma size was 45, mm. uh, so that would be reducing them by 30 milliliters. We did not get perfect adherence, mm. uh, but it was good. 60% uh, mm. of the teams mm. were able to get the hematomas down uh, to under 15. So, so one of the pre-specified uh, secondary analyses was to look at uh, what you ended up with, how much blood did you remove, mm -hmm. and whether this influenced outcome. Mm -hmm. And we were struck by, uh, the, uh, when we looked at the proportion of patients that reached this 15 ml outcome versus those that didn't, mm -hmm. uh, that there was a very big effect mm -hmm. uh, in that the ones that did reach it uh, did have a functional benefit, while the ones that did not did not have functional benefit. So that then motivated the, the second analysis that I present uh, uh, in that second paper, which has to do with how much blood do you have to remove to accomplish mortality benefit and functional benefit, uh, uh, limiting our analysis to the surgical cohort that got the procedure. And the second thing we asked is what are the factors, both patients and surgeons and site that influence that type of performance. So the big finding was that uh, you could start having an effect at improving life by, uh, or, or saving lives, by uh, removing half the clot, okay? However, in order to accomplish the functional benefit, you do have to remove more than 70% of the clot and, or be left with less than 15 ml. So an average performance to the trial endpoint was not good enough. You needed to have every patient reach that uh, outcome. And if they did, uh, we believe that the odds of functional uh, benefit would have been an odds ratio in the range of two, which is very, very strong once you get below the 15 ml.
So that, that's very intriguing. So just thinking a little bit ahead, if one was to plan another trial right. looking at this specific issue, how could one make sure that participants, investigators, are better able to adhere to the protocol so that we can remove as much of the clot as possible? Yes, so there are two factors to this. First of all, once they got close to the point of 15 ml, many surgeons lost the equipoise. They were wondering if it was worth the risk to give more doses, and we didn't know that, that you needed to go all the way. They thought that average is good enough, right? Uh, uh, however, uh, that turned out not to be the case. So knowing that, the whole education uh, of surgeons and performance of the surgeons will shift uh, from uh, an average performance to an every case performance. And that would call for, for a little bit greater experience threshold. So what I'm hearing both of you say is one, uh, a relatively safe procedure. Two, that there was an effect on mortality, which is huge. Three, uh, removal of the extent of the clot is extremely important. And then four, compared to ischemic stroke, while time is extremely important, it is not as important within a very narrow time frame as compared to ischemic stroke. So still crucial uh, to get there on time, get the procedure done on time, but we are learning that compared to ischemic stroke, it is not as crucial. I think you got a good summary there. Well, I just want to congratulate both of you again on addressing a very important question. Um, intercerebral hemorrhage is really a devastating condition for which you really don't have any good treatment. So having both of you take time and effort to dedicate to addressing this question is very, very impressive. So congratulations. I also want to remind all of you, this is what ISC 2019 is all about. It's really about advancing the science, getting great scientists who present that science, and moving the field forward. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.